am the sword in the darkness. I am the watcher on the walls. I am the shield that guards from the realm of men. I pledge my life and honor to the night's watch for this night and all the nights to come. Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and night truly has gathered as we start discussing faction identity and the tactics deck for the Night's Watch for A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game. If you're new to this series, essentially what I'm doing is I'm going through all of the tactics decks of uh, the 2021 update or 1.7, whatever you want to call it, and trying to uh, suss out the faction identity going into these new updates for each faction. You know, we've, we've had a long time with the old tactics decks that didn't change at all, uh, other than maybe a few clarifications here and there. And we had some really good guidelines or established identities for the factions that existed. But now I think things have kind of uh, pulled into different focus for these tactics decks that kind of give you a different sense of what the faction identity is or gives a, f a better view on what the flavor of them is. And we've gotten lucky in some of the previous videos in that we were able to just kind of take that tactics deck on its own and figure out what the identity was based on that and not really have to plug in a whole lot from the uh, outside things like units and commanders and things like that. With the Night's Watch, that's really difficult to do because if you were to take a look at their tactics deck as is without any you know, without looking at any of the units, period. It is really, like, hodgepodgey and not really all that powerful. There's just not a whole lot going on in the tactics deck. But uh, the, the deal with the Night's Watch is that all of their units are extremely elite. They're pretty pricey. They always hit well. They throw tons of dice. They have decent combat stats or abilities. But they're not all that flashy. You know what I mean? It, the Night's Watch are just kind of, like just good they're elite infantry that's priced for being elite there's very few things in the faction that are cheap i mean we've got the war machines and the conscripts but those kind of serve a different purpose that i don't think we'll get into in this video but we'll probably talk about it later on as we start building some lists with them but essentially the tactics deck when you look at the way the uh the units are are set up the tactics deck functions to kind of support and buff the the night's watch infantry it's almost like uh you're just you're doing nothing but enhancing them with the tactics deck it's not they're not really flexing a whole lot or adapting to things on the table so much they're kind of like i wouldn't call them so much a swiss army knife for the game but they are very adaptive and can kind of solve problems depending on which kind of which kinds of cards you're playing on them but uh if you're new to the game we used to call these vows and essentially when you would play one of these cards you would attach it to the night's watch unit and you could only have one card attached to a unit back then you always had to kind of swap them out nowadays there's no restriction on how many cards you can have attached to a night's watch unit but they're not specifically called vows anymore they just work like regular uh tactics cards that would attach to a unit so that's definitely something that we can kind of talk about a little bit more but let's go ahead and start getting into the tactics cards and explain you know what what it is they do and how they kind of bring in to focus the identity of the Night's Watch. First up in the discussion is the Sword in the Darkness. Now I used to affectionately refer to this as the Sword in the Barkness because you used to be able to put this on Ghost and it was pretty nasty. That changed and now it's kind of changed a little bit again, but the Sword in the Darkness has a trigger of when a friendly unit is performing a melee attack but before they roll their attack dice. If the defender has not activated this round, they become panicked and vulnerable if the attacker is a Night's Watch unit, you attach this card to them until the end of the game. While the card's attached, this unit's melee attack gains plus one attack die. So uh, you can kind of see right off the bat, this is really a card that kind of pushes that uh, aggressive feel. You know, it's it's the part of the vow, of, you know, I'm the sword in the darkness, where they... Uh, get to instill fear and make their enemies cower under the weight of their swings and then if they're night's watch of course you can attach this to them and they get that plus one attack die since this card triggers before the attack dice are rolled that's before you calculate how many dice you actually roll it's nice because you can get that plus one attack die on top of this so not only are you getting a little bit more oomph out of that unit you're also getting those two abilities right or those two condition tokens right away to try and push that aggressive advantage you know uh sword in the darkness uh, i feel like it's a 
a pretty strong card going into the the new version. I know a lot of people might look at this as a little bit of a um, a, a step back or a setback compared to what it used to be before. And I don't want to get too deep into how um, one to one comparisons of like what what we had before is like a, a trap, but. This card right now, in the current state of the game, is pretty decent. This gives the Night's Watch the ability to get through something that has some heavy armor or get uh, some extra damage through panic on something that is, uh, you know, lower morale or even just try and make something that has that good morale fail it just by making them re-roll a little bit. Um, otherwise, this this will stay on that unit for the whole game and give them that plus one attack die. And since the Night's Watch combat units typically have pretty high attack stats and like slight decays uh this card's gonna make uh you're gonna make a lot of use out of this card as the game goes on especially since your ultimate hope is to have a night's watch unit stick around for a really long time it's one of the things about night's watch that makes them another it's another bit of them that is unique in that they do have a lot of elite units so when you build the list it looks like it's really small and you would have to worry a lot about uh about losing those units because when you do it's a big blow but there's also quite a bit of healing in night's watch to keep them around and uh, sword in the darkness is just one of those cards where once you get it on a unit you hope that it goes the long run because this will uh pay off a lot as the game goes on for every attack you take you're getting that extra die it just counts up oh you know, it almost could feel like the unit got a whole one extra or two extra attacks depending on how you end up getting this one to shake out Next up, we've got the fire that burns against the cold. When a friendly unit's performing a morale test after rolling the dice is when this triggers, that unit can then re-roll any dice from the test, and if it targeted a Night's Watch unit, it gets attached to them. It's kind of that vow mechanic, you know, it's that doesn't exist anymore, but that's what I'm going to call them for forever. It's just going to stick with me. But while this card is attached, each time this unit gains a condition token, you can suffer two wounds, minus one for each of your destroyed ranks, and if it does, you remove that token then. So there's a lot going on on this card to unpack. You know, a lot of these vows seem like they're pretty straightforward, or of these tactics cards. Sorry, I'm going to keep doing that. But these seem pretty straightforward, and you don't really think that, oh, this isn't really, you know, a super impactful thing. But the cool thing about Fire That Burns Against the Cold is that you get to see if you fail that morale test first before you ever try to re-roll the dice off of this one. So you, it's not something that you have to play when you take the panic test. You at least get to see if you can pass it on your own, and then it's on. It's kind of turned into one of these, like... Uh, get out of jail cards because uh the night's watch morale is usually pretty good so when you fail morale it's really a big blow to that unit but this just allows you to get that extra rally to get back into it and not take that mor that morale or not fail that morale test while it's attached while it's attached it does some pretty cool stuff too you know night's watch like i said they have quite a bit of elements in their list that can heal them so by doing something like suffering two wounds to stop a condition token while it may not seem like it was it would be the smartest thing to do for the night's watch that's not so bad it's actually really good because you can restore wounds uh easily and the um the the impact of the condition tokens against a Night's Watch player is more than almost any other faction out there. I mean, you can argue that Baratheons with their vulnerable tokens is really rough because they have a good armor stat, but with your army being so small and having a lot of their points con consolidated into these very elite combat specialty units, having something like Weaken or Vulnerable go on them is not something you want to have happen because anything your opponent can do to lower that one module's efficacy really hurts you and sets you back but having something like fire that burns against the cold on that unit all they have to do for the low price of two wounds is that or that's all they have to do to sh to shunt that condition token off it's really worth noting that um as that unit starts to whittle down its efficacy isn't such isn't so hindered because night's watch are pretty good up until the bitter end so if they are on one rank, you're able to just shunt that off without having to actually take any wounds. And I think that Fire That Burns Against the Cold is going to be one of those cards that a lot of people are going to find really annoying once they start playing against it. Next up in the discussion, we have the Shield of the Realms of Men. Now, that sounded like it was difficult for me to get out because I want to say the shield that guards the realms of men. And I think that's what the, the oath was in 
the show. I'm not so sure if it was changed in or if it was different from the book and that's why they decided to update the card but um maybe someone in the comments section can let me know because i've never seen the oath in the book i've only ever heard it in the show so that one's going to be a hard one for me to get used to but this triggers when an enemy is performing an attack after rolling the defense dice target the defender they may re-roll any of those defense dice, and if you target a Night's Watch unit with this after the attack's completed, you can attach it to them for the rest of the game. While the card is attached, each time this unit is attacked after rolling defense dice, they block one hit. So the real nice thing about this card is it's much like the fire that burns against the cold and is a very reactionary one. You get to see the results of the defense dice to see if the unit needs help with that before you ever need to choose to play this card. The only thing that's not so great about it is that um, you attach it after the attack's completed, so you don't get to just auto-block one hit when you play this. You need to survive that attack, and then after that you'll be able to auto-block that one hit. Um, still a really nice deal. The, the, the armor or defense saves of the Night's Watch units are pretty middling, um, but with the shield... Shield of the Realms of Men, you're able to just automatically block one, and there's plenty of ways in the faction to increase your defense save, so this becomes pretty helpful and handy. Just being able to auto-block one that would have slipped through otherwise is, it goes pretty far in making sure that a unit becomes a little bit more survivable. Now we come up on the Watcher on the Wall. This triggers after a friendly unit is attacked. You target one friendly combat unit other than the Defender. That unit pivots and then shifts two inches. If this unit is a Night's Watch unit, you attach this card to them until the end of the game. And then while it's attached, this unit gains plus one to their movement and may re-roll any charge distance dice. So the, the Watcher on the Wall used to be uh, quite a nasty card in the 1.6 and earlier versions it ended up letting you make a full advance and or not full advance uh, a, a full maneuver and uh, that was pretty pretty nuts but right now uh, this card is still quite functional you get to do that two inch shift and pivot so it might be enough to kind of set you up for getting into a flank on an enemy or kind of saving yourself from another charge um, i i can't state enough how much adding two inches to someone's charge can kind of really make them think twice about what they're going to do and have to reshape their entire turn and for a unit like night's watch that at the at first glance doesn't seem like a very flexible one like they just kind of have this really ham-fisted style about them this card can definitely catch people off guard and then while it's attached you get a threat extension with the plus one to your movement speed and most of the Night's Watch units are, they're not super slow. I mean, they're they are speed 5 and speed 6 most of the time. So being able to get them up higher is always nice. And then being able to just always roll your charge distance dice till the end of the game. This is, this is still an extremely powerful card. It's not as much of a gotcha or a reshape of your, of your opponent's plans uh, as it used to be. But I still think that this is quite effective in not just extending threat, but confounding your opponent in there, you know, when they've got a plan set out ahead of them, and just making sure that that unit can be really threatening for the entire game. Because as a small list, like a, a very narrow list, right, you won't have a whole lot of units as a Night's Watch player since all of your stuff is quite expensive. Making sure that when a unit does its job on one side of the table, like it cleave, cleaves through an enemy after a turn or two, you want to make sure that you have the, the speed and distance to get to where you need to to start affecting the rest of the table that you might need help with. And Watcher on the Wall makes sure that that unit can be more effective in kind of or rubber banding into the game uh, when they've already kind of finished everything they needed to on their area of the table. Next up, we have a new card to the Night's Watch Tactics deck, and that is the Light That Brings the Dawn. This card triggers when a friendly unit's performing a melee attack before rolling their attack dice. This attack re-rolls any misses, and if this targets a Night's Watch unit, you attach this card to that unit until the end of the game. While it's attached, when attacking enemies with more remaining ranks, this unit's attacks roll their highest attack die value. So, there's a lot to unpack with this card. It seems pretty straightforward, but, you know, as a Night's Watch player, you're probably going to be, you're not going to, I shouldn't say as a Night's Watch player, as any player with any unit in the game, you're not likely to always one-shot whatever you go into. There are some exceptions uh, that exist in the game still, but 
for the Night's Watch, by and large, especially if you're in a two-list pairing situation, people are typically probably going to be dropping something that's a little more heavily armored against you so that they can kind of survive some of the really good attacks that you've got. I mean, we've got Sundering in the Night's Watch quite a bit, and we do roll a lot of dice, and we hit accurately. So uh, with that, it means that you're probably going to be in these prolonged engagements, and once you get out of that engagement, once you finally whittled that enemy out, um, you, you know, you're... Well, I'll, I'll step this back a little bit. So you're in that prolonged engagement. If you got the charge, you'll be able to re-roll your dice no problem. But then when you activate again and you want to make sure that you're able to finish that unit off, you can play this card to get the light that brings, brings the dawn attached to them so they can re-roll those misses, getting maximum efficiency out of that prolonged engagement. And then as the game goes on, you know, Night's Watch can keep a unit around for a really long time, but you're still going to be having uh, a lot of uh, some bodies missing. So with that, you want to, once you finish that prolonged engagement and get into the next unit, if that more likely than not, they're going to be a fresh unit and you'll have, be, you'll be missing a rank or two by then. And the light that brings the dawn, just make sure that you can get the most out of that unit for the the rest of the game it just you get to fight to the bitter end always having your max attack dice and the the thing that makes this card really cool that it might not be something you notice right away is that unlike some of the other cards that have to do with attacking where you attach the card after the attacks completed this one attaches immediately when you play it so not only do you get to re-roll your misses but if the enemy you're attacking at the specific instant you play light that brings the dawn has more ranks than you you get to roll your highest attack die value so the light that brings the dawn attached to something your opponent can kind of be scared over it and maybe try and work around it a little bit or focus it a unit down to make sure that they don't uh, have to deal with you know two veterans with Jon Snow running around rolling a, a bunch of dice at you with only a couple guys left in the unit but uh, you can also kind of spring this on them as a surprise to say, okay, you left this unit with a couple wounds behind, so now I'm going to be re-rolling my misses, and I get to roll my highest attack die value. It's nice if, if someone gets the drop on you. So Light That bring the, Brings the Dawn is very is a very welcome addition to the Night's Watch Tactics deck, and I think this is going to be another one that people, when they see it played, are going to be very not happy about the fact that it exists. Next up, we come across Take the Black. Now, this is a legacy card from the 1.6 uh, Tactics deck for the Night's Watch, and it's gone under some slight modifications that I think boost up its uh, usefulness quite a bit. Now, Take the Black is a phrase that uh, people would use in the world of A Song of Ice and Fire to denote that you are becoming part of the Night's Watch, and it's quite thematic, um, not just in 1.6, but still now to kind of communicate that that's what's going on in the game. So, this triggers when an enemy unit is destroyed. You target one friendly Night's Watch infantry unit within short range. That unit restores four wounds. You may then take one infantry attachment from that destroyed unit and attach it to this unit. You have to replace a model, but that's, you know, you don't. it's not like you get another wound on top of that. So, in 1.6, take the black was variable in a couple different ways. You had to choose whether you took that attachment from them or you took the heal. And the heal was D3 plus one. So killing an enemy unit, especially now, is quite a big deal. So if you had to not just pick one of those two, like they, they, if they had a decent attachment, that might be good. Um, you had to always wrestle with yourself on whether you wanted to get that attritional advantage by healing your unit back up and maybe only two when you were ex hoping for four. And picking between that uh, that attachment that may or may not help you. But now you don't have to do that. You get four wounds automatically for destroying a unit, which is a, a good reward, or it's a reward that matches the deed, right? It's difficult to kill units going into 1.7, or it takes a little bit longer to do so. And by the time you've done that, you've definitely suffered some wounds. And it doesn't have to be the unit that destroyed the enemy that gets those wounds back if you have a a little brick of night's watch kind of hanging out in the middle you can just heal another infantry unit if the one that was making the attack was full and didn't really need those um the attachment works the same way and uh 
well, the attachment has to go into the, the unit that got healed also, um, but you just get to take the attachment anyways, so no longer do you have to choose between these, and it makes Take the Black a really great rubber band card, and when I say that, I mean it's a card that can take you from a disadvantaged position and put you in an advantaged one because you, you get to put that pressure on your opponent of taking a unit out and then playing Take the Black to refill a unit and get that attachment, so if they have something really nasty in there, like the, the mountain, you can just say, well, now the mountain is uh, wearing some fur and a black cloak around him, and he's running around with some veterans of the Night's Watch, and that's going to be uh, quite a nasty bulldozer for your opponent to have to respond to. I think Take the Black has a lot of potential uh, to, to be a phenomenal card for the Night's Watch. Pretty much all of these are, the potential is always awesome. They just are such, they're, they're, cards that don't feel like they do a lot until you actually see what they do and take the black is just its value town the last card in the deck is and now his watch is ended uh, it triggers at the start of any turn you attach this card to the friendly night's watch unit uh, while attached, when another friendly Night's Watch unit is destroyed, you may discard this card, and if you do, you move one friendly attached tactics card from that unit to this unit, and then the, this unit performs one attack, maneuver, or march action. So this card has quite a bit of cool stuff going on with it. Um, first off, you used to have to wait until the unit died to trigger this off, but now since uh, space in your hand is a hot commodity you know we can only hold on to five cards at a time under most circumstances you don't want things like this clogging up your hand because you're just waiting and waiting you know if you if imagine if you had to wait until this uh for this card to trigger at when a unit had had been destroyed you'd just be sitting on it until that happened and with night's wash being very uh very healing oriented or being able to get a lot of healing going on in them you would be holding on to it for quite some time, but now you can just get it out of your hand and on the table, and then your opponent has to think twice about what they're doing to other units. You might have, like, the Mega Sworn Brothers that are running around with, like, three or four attachments on them, and just wrecking face, and your opponent might be having a very specifically difficult time with one card that's attached to them, and they want to get rid of that unit because they've already kind of bulked out on, on all of their vows or attachments. And if they do get rid of that, it doesn't mean that the card that's giving them a hard time is gone, because another unit will be able to get uh, take advantage of and his now and now his watch is ended. I'm sorry, there's just too many like weird words in here for me to string them together through normal conversation. I always want to say and now his watch has ended and not is ended. I'm telling you, it's just doesn't work for me. I think I always, whenever I triggered this card in previous versions, I would always say and now his watch has ended. But at any rate that rant aside once you do get that attachment pulled off from the other unit and, and put on the the new one you get to you get this massive amount of flexibility you know i could had kind of lamented the loss of uh, watcher on the wall but now we've kind of got that baked in here where you can take an extra attack with a unit and if you got a really nice offensive uh tactics card from that from the unit that was destroyed uh it can be quite devastating also, you can march or maneuver. Being able to just march out of nowhere is super big. You can get onto objectives that your opponent thought might take you a couple turns to get to, or you might be starting to get into flanks or rears of enemies to start charging off at them. It's uh, And now his watch has ended is just a really brutal card, and in 1.6 when it was played, it was something that you never really liked hearing, and that's not going to change now, but I think at, since it attaches early in the game, your opponent might forget about it, and that can that in and of itself can be a really big deal. Uh, just having your opponent kind of forget what's going on on the table because they're too busy focusing on what is happening right in front of them. They're not able to plan for how a card like this can affect the game, and by the time you actually watch a unit go down and trigger this, your opponent might have might just just might not have the flexibility to respond to something like this, and it'll help you push a lot of advantage in the game that you might not have really respected just looking at this card for what it is. Now it's quite difficult to kind of get to at that faction identity uh, concept with the Night's Watch without looking at some of those units, and I don't think we'll be able to do that really here to kind of illustrate the point, but you know, Night's Watch have things that are extremely fighty. They have the slippery ranger hunters or the really stout, hard to shift uh, 
veterans of the watch and these cards serve to just take the things that those units are good at and make them better you know even something like the ranger trackers getting beefed up with some of these more combat focused cards could be really helpful too i think that uh the other thing to keep in mind with the way night's watch work in 1.7 is that you are no longer held to the restriction that a unit can only have one of these cards attached at a time. Back when this was referred to as the vow mechanic, vows specifically could only have uh, could only you could only have one of them on a single unit. You couldn't start stacking them. So it's almost like if you're if you're really interested in making like that Megatron type unit, the Night's Watch is really somewhere you should start looking to because that's exactly what they do. They take these. Uh, these brutal units, brutally effective stout units, and they just snowball to becoming more and more of a hassle. You know, the longer the game goes with you putting a bunch of attachments on something like Sworn Brothers, the more of a pain in the butt they are to deal with. And when they actually start steamrolling through things and start killing units, if your opponent's done any damage to them, you have plenty of ways to heal them, not just within the tactics cards like Take the Black, but you also have Maester Amon and Jon Snow as the commander attachment with Rallying Cry. There's just a ton of ways to make sure that these units get really, really strong and make sure they stick around. So if I had to kind of pin the Night's Watch identity down, it's taking super strong units making them amazing and sticking it out until the till the bitter bitter end and that is the type of person or unit that you want serving as the last line of defense against all of the dangerous things in the world unfortunately in the game uh, they aren't always creating a defensive line sometimes they are just being jammed down your opponent's throat with five different attachments on them rolling re-rolling their all their dice and rolling a ton of attack dice and blocking hits just being really hard to shift and you can't really do much against them in terms of trying to use condition tokens because they've got answers to that too it's almost like night's watch kind of this is where you get that sense that they're almost like a swiss army knife faction they kind of have the answer to every situation it kind of makes them you know rigid but flexible at the same time it's really strange the night's watch is just one of those units where when you play it you start to really get a feel for how the faction is supposed to work even though when you first look at those cards you might not quite get the gist like we can with some of these other factions so i hope you enjoyed this tactics d deck discussion i know we couldn't really hammer down on the faction identity so much with night's watch but i do think that we did our best to kind of convey what it is the Night's Watch are bringing to the table and how they're going to be quite a, quite a contender in the 1.7 update. 